What's up, guys? My name is Miles. And my name is Fez. And this is The Commodity. And today we are reacting to Kingdom of Majapahit, Wrath of Khan, Extra History, Dash, Hashtag 2. Number two. Oh. <laughs> but I, the way that the person that's telling the story, they say Majipat. Majipat? Yeah. Hmm. Like they don't say hit. So we did the part one. If you guys haven't seen it, go ahead and click back to that video. We'd love for you guys to watch it. This is a continuation of that. Uh, and as we said in the last video, the illustration and the, the storytelling behind it is amazing. Uh, so if you guys enjoy the actual video, go ahead and click over to their channel as well and subscribe to them. And before we hop in, guys, if you would, go ahead and give this video a like. It helps get it out to more people. Also, if you could, go ahead and click the subscribe button and the bell notification icon. That way you guys can see our future videos. And if you would like to help support the channel even more, you can click the join button down below. Without further ado, this video was suggested to us again by Sleeping God Part 2. Same person that suggested Part 1, so thank you so much. Let's check this out. Let's do it. 1292. Marco Polo sits idle in a Sumatran port, waiting for the trade winds to shift so he can return home to Venice. He spends his time collecting stories about an island called Java. Mariners say it's the largest island in the world, he writes, that it's subject to a great king and pays tribute to no one. People speak of its wealth and the spices it produces. Nutmeg. Yeah. Java's ports throng with merchants and its treasure, they say, is beyond telling. And I can assure that the great Khan could never get possession of this island. He writes, on account of the great distance and the great expense of an expedition. <coughs> the stories Polo heard were exaggerated. Sumatra was in fact larger than Java, and the island didn't grow spice, it just controlled the trade routes. Hmm. But he was right <laughs> about one thing. The great Khan should have left Java alone. Dun dun dun. Yeah. Three years earlier, an imperial envoy makes his case before the king of Singhasari, the Singhasari. greatest power on Java. The great Khan, he says, has been monitoring conditions in this southern ocean. He'd watched as Singhasari had aggressively expanded, taking over Srivijaya's crumbling vassal empire to its east and conquering Bali to its west. The great Khan had seen how this sent the shipping lanes into disorder. And it had not escaped the Khan's attention that Singh Hasari had rebuffed his order to send royal captives to the Mongol court, as any good vassal should. Now, he offered one last chance to comply. The king of Singh Hasari had seen this conflict brewing. For centuries, the archipelago's kingdoms had sent trade missions carrying spices, resins, and fine wood to the Chinese emperor, who then sent back gifts of porcelain and silk. The Chinese had always called these tributes, since the imperial throne did not engage in anything as crass as trade. And as the states of Southeast- We're too good. We're too good to trade. Is it you? <laughs> That's a tribute. <laughs> Loser. <laughs> Asia had gone along with it. China could call the trade whatever it wanted, as long as the ships kept coming. Thought Once the hair. Mongols began rampaging through China, and that tribute system broke down, the archipelago began a much more direct trade with Chinese merchants. Now, these new Mongol emperors wanted to make Singh Hasari a Singh true Hasari. vassal. But Singh Hasari was a power on the rise. Their king had built a miniature empire and controlled the spice for cotton trade with India. He'd even been inducted into the mystic Himalayan school of tantric Buddhism that Kublai Khan himself practiced. The king of Singhasari may have, in fact, done so in preparation for a conflict. Wanting to be the spiritual equal of the Khan and know what mystical powers he could call upon, Singhasari was no vassal and would not be treated as one. When the envoy presented himself at the imperial court, the emperor knew that the mission had failed. He could read it on the man's face. Because the king of Singhasari had cut off his ears. Or his nose. Wow. Or maybe just branded or tattooed him. The record isn't clear, <laughs> but one thing was- Something certain. happened. Kublai Khan swore Singh Hasari would pay for this loss of face. In 1292, the Khan's great fleet arrived off Java. It had 1,000 ships, 
20,000 wow. soldiers and orders to destroy Singh Hasari. Could you imagine relaxing? It's a nice day. You're laying out on the beach. Shooting some b-ball outside the court. And you see a thousand ships in the distance coming at you. I would yeah. run. Oh, I'd... Yeah, my <laughs> bowels would be released. They would remove the king from his throne and find a more quiet <coughs> ruler. Yet upon arrival, they found the job already half done. The fleet's envoy returned to say that the king was dead. In the three years since the imperial envoy's visit, the neighboring kingdom of Kadiri had risen up and captured the capital. There was no longer a Singhasari. Now the king of Kadiri ruled Java. But this fleet had been sent to bring the king of Java to heal. And they couldn't come back empty-handed. If Singh Hasari was gone, Kadiri would have to do. The fleet easily captured the unprepared Kadiri navy as it assembled at the mouth of a river. Then the great ships began to unload their famous Mongol troops and push into the heart of Java. And that's when they got a message. A very strange message. <laughs> It claimed to be from the rightful heir to the throne of Singh Hasari. The sender, Radin Wijaya, was the dead king's stepson. And the uh -oh. blood of his ancestor, like movie, the founder yeah. of Singh Hasari, and avatar of the god Vishnu, ran strong in his veins. But he was besieged in his new capital by the armies of the Kadiri. If the Chinese would help restore him to his throne, he would happily pay tribute to the great Khan and become his willing vassal. It was an odd proposition to put their original target's heir on the throne, sure, but eminently practical. They needed to install a vassal ruler, and here one was. So they took the deal, moving on the capital of Kadiri with Raden Wijaya's troops as their rear guard. But one thing about Wijaya, in Indonesian folklore, there are two kinds of rulers. There's the righteous prince, a mystic messianic figure that arises to save Java in its time of need. These figures were devout, steadfast, and morally upright. Then Boy, there nice. are the Yago, the fighting cock. Yago are scrappy upstarts. They're rebels and gangsters, people who are resourceful, cunning, and effective. Sounds like me. Good looking, though. <laughs> but never to be trusted. Wijaya's oh, ancestor, yeah, I'm the trustworthy. founder of Singhasari, had been a Yago. Legend said he Trust once me, been not. the greatest thief in Java, a man who used theft, flattery, and guile to go from impoverished orphan to usurper of a dynasty. And Wijaya was a fitting successor to that legacy. When Singhasari fell, he'd been up north with the army, crushing a rebellion. While there, he'd received word that the king of Kadiri had forced the capital. His father-in-law had died surrounded by mandalas and ritual objects, attempting to save his kingdom through mystic ceremonies as the palace burned around him. But Wijaya had something better than rituals to protect him. He had an army, <coughs> and over the next year, he attacked the Kadiri forces, handing them three defeats. But these victories got him no closer to taking the capital. If he wanted to survive, he'd need to establish a base of operations and wait for his moment. So he approached a prince who'd supported the Kadiri rebellion, asking for refuge in exchange for submission. The prince, who figured allying with Wijaya might be a smart bet in the long term, agreed. Wijaya settled on the Brontus River, a place between the island's biggest port and its inland rice terraces. When he arrived, one of his spot. followers plucked a fruit from a tree. After tasting it, the man threw it away, complaining that it was bitter. Wijaya decided that would be the name of his new capital. Bitter fruit. Maja <laughs> Pahit. Maja so now Pahit. that the Mongols Pahit. were here, the waiting was over. His chance had arrived. He led the Mongol army's rearguard as they battered their way into the Kadiri capital. They captured the usurper, took his family hostage, and broke his army. <coughs> the Mongols had done their part. <clears throat> now, it was Wijaya's turn to hold up the bargain. And, of course, he was happy to pay the tribute as agreed. Oh, but hey, uh, one little thing. His treasury was back in Majapahit, of He's course. He's not trustworthy. If they could lend him an escort, he could lead them straight to their reward. Wijaya was, of course, being polite. These escorts were prison guards, not honor guards. He was a captive and had little choice. 
<laughs> and so he led them back to his new lands of Majapahit and straight into an ambush. The army of Singhasari, now Majapahit, annihilated the Mongols, who weren't so formidable without their horses. Afterward, Wijaya took his troops into the jungles and rice terraces, engaging the Chinese in a hit-and-run guerrilla war, which was not great as far as the Chinese commanders were concerned. Guerrilla wars take time, and they weren't supposed to start an occupation. Their orders had been to destroy a kingdom, and they had done that. Sure, it was the wrong kingdom, but whatever. <laughs> Check. And they taken kingdom. royal hostages <clears throat> from a family no longer in power, granted, but let's call that a check. <laughs> They'd installed a new ruler, which, okay, it was the heir to the guy they were supposed to remove, but, but you know what? Still check. new. Check. Good job, everyone. Roll out that mission accomplished banner, and let's go. And so, the Great Khan's punitive expedition dropped sail and left. Chinese fleets would be absent from the archipelago for the rest of the Yuan dynasty. And meanwhile, wow. Radin Wijaya yeah. sat in a new palace, heir to his father-in-law's project to expand and strengthen Javanese power. A new empire was on the rise. The empire of Majapahit. Okay, so they do say Majapahit. Majapahit. And there's like five or six of these, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, honestly, what if that really wasn't even his stepson? Right, just he some just, guy like, being held mine. captive. Yeah, that's my dad. Yeah, throw okay. me up there. I'm sure somebody knew somebody. Somebody had to have known yeah. somebody that knew somebody that knew something about somebody. So they would know that that somebody was somebody that needed to be the somebody. It and it was him. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I assume. <laughs> All right, guys. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. If you want to see our future videos, hit the subscribe button and the bell notification. And if you want to support us directly, hit the join button. And with that being said, my name is Miles. My name is Fez. Thanks for watching, guys. Peace. Out.